Here we come. Now the world don't Exciting and new. Good time. Any time you need a payment. You take a good, you take a bad, you take a more from there, you have the facts of life. It's TV Talkaholics in your ear holes every month. It's already April. Hi, Matthew. Hi, JFF. Well, we have a very special episode, and I'm not sure if you realize how special this is coming up, because as I started to do my research and as I watched these episodes uh, of this, I, I had to admit and say, I never watched this show. Oh. I don't think we've ever done an episode of the podcast with something that I didn't watch. The tables are always turned the other way with shit that I love. And then you watch and you say, David, what is wrong with you? Mm -hmm. So now we're going to be talking about head of the class season three, episodes 13 and 14 little shop till you drop, which had an original air date of February 15th, 1989 and February 22nd, 1989. So originally aired over two weeks. It was never a one hour special. And for those of you like us already feeling elderly, that is 35 years ago as of the recording of this, where Matthew and I are, because we're recording this at the end of February. Mm -hmm. So, Matthew, I'm going to rely on you a lot. Oh, dear. To guide me through, because did did you watch this uh, on the regular? Because it's it's just a tiny bit after my time. It happened when I was in college. So was this more in your developing, you know, your your fetish years? Of course, because you're it, you're so much younger. It definitely was, but it was never a show that was in um heavy syndication. It wasn't, was it? So it was kind of a one and done thing. And I remember it being enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching it and liking it, but I haven't I I haven't watched it since. Yeah. Like, but it left an impression. I mean, in the fact that like this was the first time I had seen like a little shop of horrors like on the stage, quote unquote, you know. And After they did other scene. shows, other seasons. Like they did Grease, did they? And they did Hair. They did Grease. They did Hair. Mm. And Hair, the episode of Hair, has Elaine Stritch in it as one of the teachers who's against them doing Hair. Yeah. Because her son, she lost her son in Vietnam and blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, Little Shop is is like the sweet spot for me. Yeah. And and I I thought this this had this did certainly have a lot of charm, but it was interesting to be the person approaching this as the the stranger in a new land, and watching some of the performances and going ooh oh okay wow they they all right they they didn't think they needed another take of that huh one hundred percent yeah so it is it ran from nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety one. So it is, uh, it kind of um, mirrors Golden Girls. It had, it was the five seasons in the middle of the seven of Golden Girls. So it was in that time, but it wasn't appointment television for me, as I said, because, uh, you know, those are my college years. Um, but they did 114 episodes over five seasons. So 114, that's plenty to syndicate. I'm surprised it didn't uh, start rotating more heavily. And for those like me who didn't know anything about it, it's about a class of academically gifted students in a high school. Sort of the anti-Welcome Back Cotter, if you will. Now, Welcome Back Cotter, there is a show I will not probably ever suggest we revisit. You are welcome. Thanks. Because I, I think I have seen a couple of Welcome Back Cotters in recent years and thought 
it's not just, oh, this is cheesy. Oh, this is old hat. Like they are unwatchable. <laughs> like bad. Even with that sex symbol, Gabe Kaplan. I'm telling you, the head of the pussy posse, straight uh, from his gig on the unaired pilot of the love boat where he fucks this model. I'm mm. telling you, because, you know, she could have any of the dudes over at the pool in their Speedos and their bulging pecs. And, yeah. and nope, he went over and charmed the bikini off of her. <sighs> she's, got, she's got to choose between doc and and gabe kaplan i don't know how she picked <laughs> exactly bernie capel or gabe kaplan Oof. <laughs> who do we add to that trifecta to play fuck mary kill <laughs> dick van patten dick van patten <laughs> so dick van patten <laughs> bernie capel and gabe kaplan oh, no 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 stop okay fuck mary kill go oh I feel like you would kill Dick Van Patten, but anyway, I yeah, don't want the answer I would, for I you. I would kill Dick Van Patten. <laughs> I would probably marry Gabe Kaplan because he might make me laugh. I feel like at some point, being a little nebbish that he mm -hmm. is, um, but I, I would probably have to fuck Doc, Bernie Capel. Hmm. Well, I don't. There's no right answer to that. There's no. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 no matter how you slice it, you're going to lose somewhere. Yeah. <sighs> I'm, I'm going roundabout because truly of the three of them, uh, I think Bernie Capel was probably in the best shape, like physically, like if I had to lay with another body. But we're talking the 1970s versions of these, not the modern day versions. And, and, and Dick Van Patten's dead, isn't he? I hope so. But... <laughs> Uh, I would be inclined to see, but see, here's the thing with Bernie Capel, also good to marry because he had such a successful uh, character actor career, the longevity of his career. He would be a great guy to support you, to, to you know, be a life partner, financially speaking. So uh, I can't believe I'm saying this. I, I don't know which I'd want Bernie Capel for. Hmm. Maybe. uh uh, I, I I would have to kill Gabe Kaplan. Abs absolutely no. <laughs> I like a furry little nebbish. Mm, yeah. So then we leave. I either have to marry or fuck. Um, you ain't gonna listen to Dick Van Patten's voice the rest of your life. No, I would. I'd take one for the team. I would fuck Dick Van Patten. I would marry Bertie Capel, and I would kill Gabe Kaplan. Listeners, why don't you weigh in? Tell us how you feel. That was very unexpected. But back to head of the class, okay? Yeah. Uh, here's the deal. I watched this and I remember thinking, holy fuck, there's a lot of kids here. Yeah. Welcome back, Cotter had five, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. We had Epstein, Washington, Barbarino, Horshack, and... Was there four? Who the hell knows? I've never seen an episode of that. Welcome back. Oh, you should totally watch it. No, thank you. <laughs> anyway, the deal is, uh, I was looking at, of course, Wikipedia, the only source I use for facts on the internet. And apparently there are 10 of them. So I wasn't sure if some of these kids were thrown in and added later and all that stuff. But yeah, this is Howard Hesseman, who had been a big star playing the part of uh, Johnny Beaver? Is that it on WKRP in Cincinnati? Johnny Beaver. Yeah, it was Don't Johnny Beaver. Beaver. <laughs> yeah. Fever. Fever, as in running a temperature of 103. Uh, yes, it was Johnny Fever. <laughs> so he had already been popular because of that. And another little sidebar. Uh, while I've been rewatching uh, Laverne and Shirley, starting from the beginning, uh, he is in a lot of little bit roles in Laverne and Shirley's early on. Like, I think I found at least three Howard Hesseman appearances before I'm, he was famous. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh? There are rumors that, what high school did um, Laverne and Shirley go to? Millard Fillmore. In New York, we're assuming, because 
she does have that that accent. There are rumors that this is the high school they went to. Shut up. Because it's Fillmore High School. Fillmore High School. Isn't it also in the Brady Bunch? Don't they also say Phil, like Fillmore Junior High? Well, I don't know. I wondered about that, and I did Google it, Matthew. So apparently this is a little educational in-joke with the middle-aged vaudevillian writers that uh, Millard Fillmore, who was our 13th president, is yeah. ranked by historians and political scientists as one of the worst presidents we have ever had. Yeah. So uh, basically the joke is if you go to Millard Fillmore, that's, that's like going to, you know, loser J loser high school. Mm-hmm. But, oh, this could be the, oh, the trouble with Laverne and Shirley is that uh, they do start out in Brooklyn and Shirley does start out with a, a New York accent. But then later they're going to the reunion of the Angora Debs and their other high school, you know, the, the, the working class element of you still know all the people you went to high school with mm. in Milwaukee. So I, well, when I say there's that rumor, I literally just started it. So, ah. <clears throat> but that's it. We talked about that. We totally did talk about that when we were talking about the the Angora Debs, right? Yeah. And the other thing, and Rosie Greenbaum. Mm. God, I fucking love her. So many green bombs in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> so many brassy. So many sassy New York accented foul mouth Jews in yeah. Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so I felt better about the fact that I couldn't keep track of all the kids. Well, because, and the kids do change. Right. There are the 10 of them. And we already have one of the new ones here. TJ, the girl. Cat, Rain uh, Pryor. The theme person who plays tj that they add to the what what's her story she's a she's a very handsome girl are you serious yeah is she famous and i should know this that's rain Pryor. and rain Pryor is is richard Pryor's daughter oh okay and i would know her from from head of the class and being richard Pryor's daughter oh see i Yes, but I will tell you, she was wonderful on this show. She was. Girl can sing. And she was like 18. Damn. She was good, but she's, ooh, she's, uh, that's a, that's a jawline that. Well, mm -hmm. it makes sense now, doesn't she? She looks like him. She does. She kind of does. Yeah. Uh. So anyway, um, other just little bits and pieces is that they did try a reboot of the series in 2021 on yeah. HBO Max. Uh, and it was helmed by Bill Lawrence, who had already started Ted Lasso. I think Ted Lasso hadn't quite exploded yet. Mm. Bill Lawrence already did have My Name is Earl and um, uh, Raising Hope. Raising Hope. Thank you. So Bill Lawrence already had a, a a record, a good track record, but it didn't work in HBO Max, canceled it after one season. It's just like, meh. But the weirdest thing about it is when I go through the Wikipedia page for Head of the Class, after I initially Google Saved by the Bell and look at it and go, what the fuck? Oh, damn it. I always confuse the titles of these two shows because you, you really could interchange the titles. Come on, cut me some sure. slack. Sure. But I was looking at their ratings. You know, I'm always fascinated, particularly if ratings drop when they change nights or television uh, time slots or something. Well, well, they always ranked in the top 30. Season one premiered at number 30, and it only got better from there. Season two came in at 23. Season three came in at 20, its best. And then seasons four and five came in at 26. And that's with Howard Hesseman lo- uh, leaving the show after season four. Apparently he was bored and finished his oh. contract. And yeah, he, ha- he hated it. Yeah. And uh, oh, it shows. Yeah. <laughs> it very much shows these fucking boning it in jesus 
So in season five, we have the adjustment to Billy Connolly, a very different vibe, very different character. Even with that, a major cast change and some of the kids rotating in and out, season five held its own. So I'm sitting there going, what the fuck happened? Why did it get canceled? And I found an article in EW Magazine from 1990 that said that basically the network said for season five, now that you have a new teacher, they basically told the creators, do better or we're going to cancel you. Because clearly... It is your fault that Roseanne's ratings are dropping. They blamed head of the class mm. that Roseanne's ratings were slipping. Yeah. What kind of stupid bullshit is that? Not Roseanne and her acute case of the bat shits. Yeah. All over every headline, every tabloid and you know, blowing up every single media outlet with her crazy. That's not bringing it to, oh, that I, I, obviously uh, that uh, I have feelings about that. Yeah. It gave me the feels and I'm feeling the feel to, to, to be felted. Mm -hmm. So the reason why we are here yeah. is we're not going to talk nuts and bolts. We'll wait a little bit. Okay. But the reason why we're here is that two of these young actors have graced the facts of life. Most prominently, we have Dan Frischman, who was Rocky in The Facts of Life Season 3, Episode 20, Kids Can Be Cruel, which ran in March of 82. And that, of course, is the same episode that was reenacted live uh, for the live in front of a studio audience. That was around the holidays of 21, I think. And Jon Stewart played the role. And honestly, Dan Frischman did it better. They should have brought him back. Yeah. It really should have. Dan Frischman would have crushed it. And he's still famous. Uh, so the other one, I forgot. I was really kind of focusing on Dan Frischman because uh, our close personal friend, Ken Reed, just had Dan on his podcast, which made me think about this show and how you had always said, David, you should watch the musical episodes. Yeah. Uh, but also, I forgot Brian Robbins. Brian Robbins, who plays the part of Eric, the tough guy, the sort of streetwise one in the leather jacket, the sort of the Vinnie Barbarino of the show. Brian Robbins was Ben in The Facts of Life Season 4, Episode 10, For the Asking, which aired in December of 82. And that's the episode where all the girls are going to the Sadie Hawkins dance, except for Natalie, and then none of them go to the Sadie Hawkins dance because of Natalie. And then at the end of the show, he comes in and says, well, I'm not going to the dance because I wanted you to ask me, Natalie, and you never did. So Natalie said, okay, let's go. Peace out, bitches. Have a nice night. And he was very, very sweet in that. That was a very nice little performance. And, and while we're talking about the cast, so just to clarify, because there's a lot of people here and some of you, like me, may not have seen it. So... Brian Robbins, tough guy, he plays the dentist in Little Shop of Horrors. Dan Frischman is the nerdy guy who ends up playing Seymour in the show. And then there's also Dan Schneider. Dan Schneider is the role of Dennis. And he it seems to be like a comedy duo with, with Arvid, with Dan Frischman. Am I correct that they sort of were uh, like the Abbott and Costello? Correct. Pairing. They're very funny together. Well, he's one that ends up being Audrey to the plant. So the three of them, interestingly, went on to fairly prominent careers producing and writing, particularly shows for Nickelodeon. A lot of the kid variety shows, the All That's, the Keenan and Kells, they all were very instrumental and involved in those early formative years of Nickelodeon producing its own programming. And we've talked about when Brian Robbins was on The Facts of Life. This is the dentist now, leather jacket dude. He has been the president and CEO of Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon since 2021 and is the chief content officer of the kids and family division of Paramount Plus. That is a big fucking deal. Yeah. Very high ranking in the entertainment industry. As I said at the time, it's like, does anyone have his number? He could probably get us a job. Does um and and we don't need to talk about Dan Schneider. You don't want to Google that. 
<clears throat> oh, that's right. There was some. What did happen? He's a creepy old dude. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so we're we're telling people I haven't I don't know what we're talking about here, so I'll just say whatever you do, do not Google any type of controversy involving Dan Schneider. I know I certainly am not going to. Yeah. As soon as we end this Zoom call. All right. So last of the students that is just of note is of course Robin Givens. It was a big deal her being on the show because two years into the show, she married a little athlete named Mike Tyson. Mm. The marriage didn't last a year, but it was a big Hollywood wedding. They were all over the tabloids. So uh, do you want to give us a synopsis? I'm okay with a longer form synopsis of this episode, just to kind of loosely talk about what, what all happens in these two. We needed two parts to tell the scope of this epic tale, yeah. mind you. Um, let me turn it over to you. Let me shut up for half a second. Well, it's just like any old lady sitcom in a school. They got to put on a show. Mm -hmm. And um, just the perils uh, that come with putting on a musical. I mm -hmm. felt they nailed it. Ugh. Did you? Like, uh, you know, any of us who have been in a musical production, it often goes just like this. It, like it, uh, it's <laughs> uh, yeah oh let me wow i'm like is this a documentary <laughs> it was almost as realistic as 2d's um broadway audition yeah <laughs> <clears throat> like it was <laughs> <laughs> nailed it <laughs> it's just like this yeah um, exactly exactly so they got to put on a little shop of horrors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, what's going on here is the scene begins. I'm not going to do scene by scene, I promise you. But they're starting out rehearsing this show called The Shepherd Prince. I've never heard of this. I'm assuming it's original. But did they write those songs or is this actually a show? Um. I don't know. I just got the feeling they didn't want to pay the rights for Gilbert and Sullivan, so they just kind of created something that was Gilbert and Sullivan-ish to get the point across that this is a show nobody cares about or wants to see. Dude, get the fuck out of my brain. I put, sounds like a bad Gilbert and Sullivan. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. So, anyhow, <laughs> let's. how about we go through all of the points? where they nailed it, where things happen exactly as mm -hmm. they do in, in a theatrical production. First of all, you have a director who, after you do a full run through of a full production number and the director starts screaming, no, 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 why would you do it that way? This is a Vernon Wimple production. I can't have that tomfoolery there. All I could think of was the guy who was the director in the backdoor pilot of The Facts of Life on, on different strokes, that awful, again, the, the stereotypical awful theater director. Well, there's a reason that it's stereotypical <laughs> because <laughs> like, I remember my high school drama teacher, we were rehearsing the play taker. She's mine. Mm -hmm. And I remember her coming, running from the back of the theater after our run through if that is how you're going to do it, I will take my name off of this. Like throwing a fit. And Your high school director did yeah, that? Yeah, she had, yeah, we called it the Claren Myers meltdown. It happened to every production. It happened, wow. and it was always her threatening to take her name off of it. <laughs> and how you're dare, like, yeah. Your nay, oh God. Yeah, and, and that's going to be the night that Mr. Guffman comes for Broadway, you know. <laughs> we can't have you, we can't have the the other directors of all the other high schools in Fort Wayne, Indiana, thinking that you're a hack. Uh, <laughs> God forbid. Wow. No, my my high school director was pretty good. She was, she was tough. Like, we we were pretty much in line. She was... Cool, but no, she never threw a, a fit. She was she was a little moody, so we were always kind of on our toes around her. So we 
always did. And we remember we had a big school too. So there was a larger pool of talent that she could pick from. So it's not like she had to do a lot of settling. Um, Cause like, you know, my graduating class was very small. We were 822. Jesus. So uh, yeah, we had a lot of kids. And uh, so, no, I, I hear about, you know, fits and shitty directors more happening in community theater right here in central Florida oh, a lot yeah. more, but it's like, it's just kind of like actors, you know, the whole thing of, oh, theater actors, and they walk into a room like this. And it seems like the, the higher up and the more professional you get, the more the, you find that the most talented people are just everyday chill people. They're normal and they're human, and they have to be in order to be good at their job. So this awful director, to the point where he comes in and he yells at Dr. Samuels. <laughs> Dr. Samuels. Wonderful. Played by the wonderful William G. Schilling. Uh, wow. This is where I literally thought, did I actually pull up Saved by the Bell? He's great. I, I really think, I think this character is on par with Mr. Belding on uh, Saved by the Bell in terms of Wow, are you lucky you got this gig? Holy shit. And he was in every episode. I love him. He's you do? So funny. The, <laughs> the, the, I think he is appalling. Oh, the takes that he does, the uh. the, <laughs> the 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 subtle humor. I uh, this uh i'm sorry yeah i enjoy him a lot you're not being facetious not at all <laughs> all right you can change the musical but i won't spend a penny i tell you not a penny yeah uh, woo! the writing isn't helping him it's got the subtlety of a chainsaw but god damn and and he was in some of the touchstone comedies in the 80s, and I really enjoyed him in those. I love him in Ruthless People, the that Midler Danny DeVito movie. But wow, I was not prepared for this. This was whoo, a little over the top here, boy. <laughs> and and you were saying that Angela Lansbury as Jessica Fletcher is performing for the balcony in the theater next door. Yeah. Holy shit. I think he's cartoonish, and I think it's exactly what the show needed. Okay, maybe I need to see more episodes to fall in love with him. I really had a problem. <laughs> I didn't find him much different than the director. And again, I'm going to say that there's... <laughs> that the director's name is Vernon Wimple. Yeah. I just... Wow. How old do you think William G. Schilling is here? 49. You looked that up. I did. <laughs> How old is Howard Hesseman? Oh, God, he's like 36 or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's 48. He's only yeah. a year younger. Howard Hesseman looks... Howard Hesseman was born looking like he was 60. He's like yeah. Carol O'Connor. Yeah. Where he always had... And, you know, and particularly, you know, as Johnny Fever. I almost said Johnny Beaver. Thank you for that. <laughs> Fucking etched in my brain now. But as Johnny Fever, he was always supposed to be kind of halfway out of it and usually drugged out and stuff. So he he played Grizzled so well on that show. I'm not sure we can ever see him, even with this cleaned up mullet. And in early seasons with a ponytail. Whoa! Oh, yeah. He was the cool teacher. Who's this teacher? What a loose cannon. He's a dude with a ponytail and an earring. Hope he's not a homo. <laughs> Jesus. If we're talking about that first scene, I don't know about you, mm -hmm. but I saw the piano player and I was like, who the fuck is that piano player? Did you notice the piano player? I, I noticed him and he is present and he's really playing. Yeah. He's playing live. So is he someone that I should know? I didn't, I forgot to look him up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how the fuck do I know that dude? So I looked it up and do you remember it went viral that 800 year old man on America's Got Talent 
that played the piano and sang, My girlfriend has a penis. No. Oh my God, David. No, I, I, you know, I miss a lot of big things. Oh, damn it. Well, then this is, anyway, point of the story is that's him. Oh my gosh. And um, he was the co producer of this show and wrote for the Carol Burnett show, wrote for, you name it. He's written and produced all of their stuff. So isn't it funny how AGT pulls this guy out and they act like he's just some old kooky dude who yeah. doesn't, who, who, I don't know what I'm doing in this business. And then does that. So I was like, again, welcome to reality television. Yeah, that's they found a They found a producer and writer for the Carol Burnett show. And yeah. we uh, pulled just him like out. They plucked him off the street or something. What's his name? Ray Jessel, R A Y J E S S E L. I know that name. When you, if you had said that's Ray Jessel, I would have been, wait a minute. He's somebody. He did something. And when you pull up his name on Google, the first image is him on AGT. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, he is 100, isn't he? Well, he's dead now, but. Uh huh. Oh, he. <laughs> Oh, he died at 85. Good Lord. He looks a lot older than that. Right. Which means how old was he in this episode? If it oh. was 35 years ago, he was 50. <laughs> he oh was 50 God. and he looks like Albert Einstein. For <laughs> he sake. does. Jesus. Oh my gosh. Writing and co-producing for the Carol Burnett show will do that to you. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. I will post a video of Ray Jessel playing My Girlfriend's Got a Penis. From America's Got Talent. I'll post that on the website for this episode. Wow. Thank you for that. Because I totally missed. I meant to, but I just forgot to. Because I wondered if he was somebody. When Howard Hesseman agrees to take over for the director who quits, he says, I'll direct it, but it has to be a different show. So in two weeks, we're going to reproduce a completely new musical. They won't get any money out of Dr. Samuels yeah. until they cast him as Mr. Mushnick. <laughs> and wrote a whole new song for him. Yeah. It's, never mind that Mushnick has a song in the show. Yeah, what what the fuck was that? I don't know. Did was that like a, a song cut from or a song, you know, written for No, it was written for this what's his pussy? Ray Jessel wrote it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, why didn't he sing? Uh, mush nick and son that's that officially yeah. i'm your brat wasn't in the movie but that's in the show yeah you're right yeah. i i want yeah totally that totally I, I thought that but then the thought went out of my mind so one thing they do get right uh, as i was saying is that the lead alan who was the shepherd prince in the other thing is now trying to do seymour and he is awful so uh yeah that's that is actually non ironically spot on. Usually, the biggest problem person, the person who's the biggest pain in the ass in the cast, often the lead, is usually the worst performer. Am I right? Oh, yeah. So that was good. Uh, just go, just watch the video of me and Lacage. <laughs> <laughs> but the deal is, uh, Another problem is we lose one of our urchins because Monica, the tall blonde girl who had been the princess and the lead in the previous production, was now relegated to being one of the three street urchins. And she's yeah. awful also. So she actually really and truly quits. And that's when they bring in TJ, Richard Pryor's daughter. That's where we let her sing. And God, she is good. She's a good addition to it. Um, and then... Uh, the other thing is that we do have Arvid and Dennis are upset that they were villagers and performing. Now they're backstage and they don't like it. So Dennis finagles his way into playing Audrey too. And Arvid, as the prompter, has to take over the role of Seymour when Alan thankfully loses his voice. Yeah. And Arvid, Dan Frischman, is the obvious choice to play Seymour. And he's quite lovely in the role. Yeah. And the part of Maria, 
is uh, Audrey for the whole thing, but she's torn because she doesn't know she can do it. Her mother has suddenly decided she's getting married the same night of the show. And yeah. I don't even like the guy, but then, then. So she almost leaves right as the show is about to start. Right. She's leaving for her mom's funeral or her mom's wedding <laughs> from high school at eight o'clock at night. Yeah. Like you do. As you do. And uh, thankfully, Howard Hesseman convinces her not to. She does the show. The, whew, the show still goes on. And as if that's not good enough, her mom ends up showing up and saying, I decided not to marry the guy. Yeah. So just walks backstage. Yeah. Like you do. Like you do. Anyone can walk backstage in the middle of a production. <sighs> so, you know, in the, in the hate slash love category, I hate the trope of the person ducking out when they're supposed to be performing. Yeah. Minutes before or seconds before the performance. That infuriates me. Like, you know, Julia did it on Designing Women, Dixie Carter. They almost let her get away with that shit. They did it on This Is Us most recently on the TV show This Is Us. The curtain goes up. The show begins. And the woman is on stage and turns and the actor does not make his entrance. And she's left just standing there. And uh, It's like, dude... You turn to your stage manager and you say, I can't go on, get the under, hold the curtain, grab the understudy, I've got to run. My brother is having an emotional meltdown and he needs me. But you to just not show up and not be there, let the curtain go up. It's just fucking preposterous. And he would never work again. Like that is <laughs> unforgivable. <laughs> Unless it's, of course, Mike Tyson. Then Mike Tyson probably could have still had a career after that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that that's a trope that just infuriates me. You know the trope I love, though? I've what? mentioned it before. When everybody <laughs> when you... lies. No, no, no. <laughs> the whole, where is Dixon Ticonderoga? <laughs> oh, where is Dixon Ticonderoga? <laughs> that whole bullshit. Was... Oh. I knew you were loving that, but uh, no, in fact, the trope I love is the talent show within a sitcom where you watch them do the whole setup for the first, you know, 20 minutes, including the commercial. And then in the last 10 minutes, you get the show. Yeah. The entire show somehow takes an entire evening of theater somehow only takes 10 minutes to happen and the audience is jumping up and down like they've just watched Les Mis. Yeah. So with this, it was a little less so because we had two parts. So we had the whole first half an hour to do some of the stuff and then the first half of the second part. But we got a nice little abridged version of Little Shop. Yeah. And and I also like that uh, of all of them, only Maria, the one that played Audrey, she was the only one that you could tell could Sing Sing, of course, on top of, you know, TJ, Richard Pryor's daughter yeah. there. Uh, you could tell all the others, they were, they could sing, they did fine. Maybe, maybe not right. so much for Brian Robbins, but <laughs> I would never say that because he's the CEO of Paramount, <laughs> could <laughs> end my career before it begins. Right. But uh, yeah, he, but he faked his way and acted his way through the dentist death scene beautifully. Uh, and and performed his lines as as though he were acting them. Yeah, he was he was doing that layer of I'm playing my character, which I play well. My character is probably not a great actor. So he was, you know, hey, Audrey, what are you doing over there? Did I tell you you could speak? There was an incredible amount of charm going on once the show kicked in. Yeah. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we had to keep cutting back to Howard Hesseman calling the show because, you know, the director usually calls the show mm -hmm. like a stage manager from backstage. Uh, like like you do. That's another thing. Nailed it. So it's a fun little show. Mm -hmm. and watch and the musical episodes are always fun. They're like the Halloween episodes of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. 
Oh, oh yes. And and the Halloween episodes of Roseanne. Yeah. Those are awesome. So um, I highly suggest you go back and watch the hair episode. I did. I did watch it. When you said we should either do the hair or this uh-huh. one, I said, let's do the the fun, the lighter one, not the the hair with the lane stretch, because oof. The the fact that I'm I'm sorry, listeners, I'm gonna spoil it for you. Elaine Stritch is just the dissenting voice saying, you shouldn't produce it. It's inappropriate. Hair is inappropriate. No, 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 no. And I'm going to fight it. I'm going to have your job. I'm going to have your nuts on a platter. And then finally, the reveal, when she gets vulnerable towards the end, she lost her son in Vietnam. Yeah. I'd be like, oh, go fuck yourself. Suck a bag of dicks, you old cunt. I am sorry you have trauma. You do not have the entitlement of ruining an entire production not going on at school. That does not, your needs and your shit does not supersede everybody else's. So go cry in the corner. I'm terribly sorry for your loss, but I'm even more sorry for what a horrible human being you are. In fairness, now, hair probably shouldn't be done in a high school. Oh, God, no, no. So, I mean, there is that. But, no, <laughs> but, no, but but her reasoning was, you was know, the veiled, different. yeah, right. the veiled reasoning and all that stuff. That was no. Yeah. And, you know, and that's just, that's also negative. And those are so many bad words. And, you know, I don't want to say things like that on this podcast. Especially about Elaine Stritch. No, no, you never want to. She'll come back from the dead and she'll fucking throttle me, man. So, oh shit, I forgot the nuts and bolts. Oh. Um, let's quickly go through these before we sign off. Uh, fortunately, the show was created by two dudes who also were the writers of this episode. So we're killing two birds with one stone. Created by Michael Elias, who was an actor and a writer. He co-wrote The Jerk with Steve Martin and Carl Gottlieb back in 79. Mm-hmm. And... Also in his resume, he created Coed Fever, which is the awful college sitcom that used the set that became the Facts of Life set for season one of the Facts of Life. Ooh. Yeah. He had been a substitute teacher himself. He drew upon that experience. The other creator and writer, Rich Eustace, has a lot of producing and writing credits on a lot of variety shows. Prior to this. So I think a lot of the but um pump and broader humor, dare I say vaudevillian humor, that's clearly Mr. Eustace's influence because it feels like he was deeply steeped in that world. And uh, the show was directed by Art Dielhen, D-I-E-L-H-E-N-N. Dielhen, I'm going to say. Maybe Dielen, if you want to speak it conversationally. He directed 44 episodes of the series total. Previously, he had done 43 episodes of Punky Brewster, lots of multiple episodes of many popular series. Look it up on his IMDb page. And the other thing I want to point out is that Little Shop of Horrors was a very new show at this point. This was very cutting edge. The, uh, you know, the original 1960 horror movie by Roger Corman, super low budget. They filmed it in like three days on a budget of $1.95, uh, was in 1960. The musical premiered off Broadway in 82, mm. and then the movie happened in 86. So here we are only in 89 doing it on TV. And here's the thing. I was in college in uh, 87. Our drama group wanted to do it. We were set to do it and we couldn't get the rights because the movie had just come out and or or was it just about to come out? So uh, but it was this, you know, one of the kids who was from New York and kind of knew more of the off Broadway theater scene because it was still very kind of an underground show. So he talked to us about it and played it for us and kind of got us excited about it. It was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we couldn't get the rights. And then uh, after the movie, they did finally bring it to Broadway in 2003. Didn't even run for a year. Uh, Most people said it's an intimate show. It's a nice small show that plays better in a small theater. And that that's what the big stage Broadway version lacked. So then they revived it again off Broadway in 2019. 
And aside from COVID, it is still running to this day as of this recording in February of 2024. Yeah. Currently, Darren Chris from Glee is playing Seymour. Now, now there's a nebbish. There's a wow. <laughs> it's part of the sexification of Broadway. Yeah. And literally, they are keeping this production open. They're doing what Chicago has been doing, where it's all stunt casting. Previous yeah. to Darren Chris, they had gotten Corbin Blue. Before him, they had gotten um Jeremy Jordan. Jeremy Jordan. God, read my brain. I was like, I was about to go, Santa Fe. Anyway. Uh so yeah. And and by the way, the musical music by Alan Menken, lyrics by Howard Ashman, who after Little Shop would go on to write The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin. And then Howard Ashman unfortunately died of AIDS. And Alan Menken would go on to write literally every other Disney musical thereafter uh up until recently i hope yeah he's, he's wonderful yeah oh his uh, man can write a damn tune mm -hmm. he certainly can uh but yeah he just they just paired him up with other lyricists and uh he's yeah he's the real deal mr mr alan Mankin. and uh yeah so that was just the nuts and boltsy informational research stuff i wanted to do so basically my final, my final thoughts on that. Hmm. I didn't, oh, I didn't think about how many talkaholic chips. Mm. Ooh. Um, I'm going to say it. Uh, it's, it's a very 1980 sitcom. Yeah. And, uh, I, I would love to explore it further to see how they treat their show Bible. You know, that's very important to me. Uh, but as far as my enjoyment of this, I, I, I'm going to give this like a, I'll give it a three and a half, mm. a three and a half, uh, just because, you know, the, the showdown between TJ and the principal where he won't let her be in the show because he wants an apology for something that she says she didn't do, which was singing in the hallways, which we heard her doing. God forbid. We heard her do it <clears throat> and a principal demanding from a student an apology. I, 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 oof. so some of the writing was was very weak and and very tropey and again a lot of kids to keep track of holy shit and nobody mentioned like they did mention we don't have a mr mushnick i'm working on that not one person said we don't have an audrey too uh, like, thank you <laughs> so yeah yeah there were there it was problematic Never yeah. mind. Never mind the whole um, Chinese eye thing that they did when they were <gasps> talking about the guy. Daru. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that. But yeah, isn't the but what what is that movement spoke like in the sixties? It was what, like the what Bat is that movie? It's like is that the Watusi? The Batusi. That's what Batman did. And, um, oh, is that what that was? The Batusi. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you know, Uma and, Thurman, Uma Thurman yeah. does it in in Pulp Fiction, so that's not like, I, I don't know, I I it did go through my mind like, ah, are we trying to make <laughs> slanty eyes? Ah, that was a little scary, a scary moment. I'm like, okay, it's the '60s. I I, I guess we can let that go, but mm -hmm. or we could have just not done it. Or yeah, or you could have done something else. <laughs> we just yeah. could have not done it. Yeah. But um, just because of that, I'm gonna give it a, a solid four. Solid four talkaholic chips from Matthew. Yeah. Okay then. Well, this wraps up another month, our dear, dear listeners. And of course, a special shout out to all of our wonderful sponsors who are still supporting us over on Patreon. Uh next month. I forget. We've we've actually talked about several things for next month. <sighs> this is one of the issues. Good thing we're only doing this monthly. Yeah. We couldn't do it weekly because I've been doing a lot of research. We were trying to find a little house in the prairie episode. And there are several. Oof. I think I watched three, including mm. a two-parter. And oh mm. my God, they were all stone cold fucking bummers. Yeah. A little house on the prairie with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, Charles has an uncle who has a staph infection and his leg rots off. Da -da 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 -da. It's like, what? Yeah. They're trying to make you as miserable watching it as the people <laughs> were who lived at that time. 
<laughs> who carried and, their lunch in a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> You know that's a particular sore spot for you. But then, you know, oh, but there's also humor. We're a dramedy. Mrs. Olsen, oh, for heaven's sake, I have a catchphrase. <laughs> Nils, I'm doing my Mrs. Garrett voice, but I don't mean to. Uh, so, yeah, that was uh, that was tricky. Um, but going... never fear. We will find something. We will. In fact, I have found... I found a love boat that I really want us to do, and I think I could get you on board with it. <laughs> you see what I did there? <clears throat> so, uh, but the trouble is it is a two-parter. But it's a two-parter where we have both Charlotte Ray and Woody Brown. Who the hell's Woody Brown? How dare you? Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> you want to talk about Ray Jessel? No. <laughs> Woody Brown was Cliff, Blair's boyfriend that she was almost engaged to. Oh, God, forgive me. The one if that you're... was a medical student, but he was secretly <gasps> an exotic dancer. If you had said Cliff, Blair's boyfriend, I would have known who you're talking about. Uh-huh. I just think with a name like Woody Brown, how do you how do you forget that? Anyway, both of them are on it, but it's a two-parter, and I'm like, ugh. So that's, it's like, okay, there's the one in the plus column. The two-parter is the minus column, but I think I found the plus column that may put us into the good realm again, Matthew. Charlotte Ray is paired up with none other than Charles Nelson Riley. Oh, okay, then. Are we in? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, the show is on YouTube. Here's the deal. Somebody has been posting full length episodes of the love boat on youtube and getting away with it i don't know how but they've been posting them in pairs and sadly the way the pairings happen the the two parts aren't in the same video part one is yeah, at the yeah. end of one and part two is the beginning of that so it's two different videos uh because i don't think the love boat is available for free streaming anywhere but no uh, but it's on youtube so we can absolutely set it up so um, let's put that out there right now that it is our hope and our intent that we're going to do another episode revisiting the love, <clears throat> the love boat. Nope. Can't get my voice that low here on the quiet storm. Yeah. Can you, can you do it? You've got a the love, the love boat. There it is. I don't know. You're so butch, Matthew. I know. I wish I was masculine like you. I know. Well, All right. I love you. Love you too, sweetie. And listeners, we love you. We will talk to you next month. Mwah! Mm -hmm. Oh, it doesn't have a theme song. I mean, it has a theme song. Nothing memorable. That The theme song was never really a thing, was it? Oh, yeah, it was. Sing a theme song for me right now. Him trying to get through New York and trying to get... Um, like the the subway is down. He stops and get a. It was almost new heartish. It was almost <laughs> um, um. Yeah, I like the theme song. It was yeah. I wasn't mad at it. Okay. I mean, the way you just did it, it's like I was there. So yeah, thank I you know. for that. Yeah. I have an orchestra in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've heard that you have at times, yes. We'll make you happy. Come and knock on our door. Come and knock on our door. We Where we're moving on. Compromising, enterprising, anything but tranquilizer. Here's the story. You take a good